Good evening. Welcome to tonight's On the Edge with me, Theo Chalmers. Tonight's show is two hours long and live. So if you have any questions for my guests during the show, text them to 8778 with the word edge, a space, and then your name, location, and your message. And we'll try to pick up any that really hit the mark. They're all charged at standard rate, so why not get ready to text? My show tonight is possibly one of the most contentious shows we have ever made. If my guest is correct, our nation no longer exists as a sovereign state. Our leaders, past and present, including Her Majesty the Queen, have committed treason. Parliament will shortly be abolished, and we will find ourselves as slaves to a Soviet-style European Politburo. My guest is a computer expert who has worked all over the world, including in New York for major companies such as J.P. Morgan Chase Bank, and who stood for Parliament in 2005 as a UKIP candidate, and also stood for that party's leadership. He flies planes, races yachts, and is one of the leading anti-European Union campaigners. His website, www.eutruth.org.uk, receives over 6,000 visitors a month. And he has driven here tonight from somewhere in continental Europe. Yes, really. He is David Noakes. What a show we've got tonight. David, welcome. Thanks, Theo. Good to meet you. Yes, good to meet you. Um, now, you've been an activist, an anti-EU activist for, for a while. How did you become aware that maybe there was another side to this European Union that perhaps we weren't being told? Well, it was 1997, and I was actually in the USA working at the time, and <clears throat> it became obvious to me that the, uh, whatever we voted for in England, we didn't get, and the same agenda just Are you, are you talking going. about just national elections? Yes. For Parliament? Yes, yes. It, the will of the people was never being implemented. It didn't matter on what subject. The government was completely ignoring the people. And I started doing some research, and uh, I started reading EU treaties, and I found out why. Okay, and what, what did you discover then? Very simply, that the European Union has the, uh, the constitution of a dictatorship, the laws of a police state, and 120,000 regulations, which, when fully enforced, will drive us into abject poverty, which is their intention. Well, OK, uh, that's a bit simplistic, isn't it? I mean, why would they have that intention, assuming that's true? Um, there are huge benefits to people who are running dictatorships. So, you know, you look at the Soviet dictatorship. A Stalin or...? Y yes, they live a life of incredible power and luxury. And um, it right the way through history. Before Roman times, from the Tower of Babel, people have been trying to create dictatorships that, where they have a superior standard of living, a massively superior standard of living, and the rest of the world are, are their serfs. That's but, their, but, their but pe people would argue, for instance, that Barack Obama has a very high standard of living, and they would also argue, and I'm not supporting this necessarily, but they would also argue that America's political system does not involve a dictatorship. Um, <clears throat> There's an agenda that's been going for a very long time. Uh, this is the third attempt to build a dictatorship in Europe. The Kaiser had a go, uh, the Fuhrer had a go, and this is the third attempt, and this is the one that looks like it's going to be successful. Well, is there a, is there a Kaiser? Is there a Fuhrer? Who is, who is that? I mean, Angela Merkel, are you saying that she's there is, the Fuhrer? There is a pyramid of power, and... Um, <clears throat> uh, at the top of the Pyramid of Powers, as you will probably know, there are the Illuminati, incredibly rich families, and at the top of those are incredibly rich banking families. Uh, the Federal Reserve, Reserve in the USA is owned by 13 banking families. Underneath them, you have the Bilderbergers, and the job of the Bilderbergers is to build the EU dictatorship. There are only 140 of them, they are all st either stunningly wealthy or stunningly powerful. Uh, Ex-presidents and, well, and, and, and well, you current can, presidents and prime ministers. Yes. And you cannot be a prime minister of England 
unless you are a Bilderberger. So uh, Cameron is a Bilderberger, is he? He had to become one, yes. About a year before he became leader of the Conservative Party, he couldn't have been... But they've had so many leaders, haven't they, the Conservative Party, in recent years. Yes. Are they all Bilderbergers? All those bald men whose names <laughs> escape me for a moment? If they look like they might make it to being Prime Minister, absolutely. Yes. No question. So, at the time of Ted Heath, um, there are always eight Bilderbergers at the top of the leadership of the Conservative Party and have been since, since Ted Heath's time, because that is enough voting power to control the Central Committee. So the Conservative Party does not represent Conservatives or Conservative voters, it represents the Bilderbergers who control it. So in Ted Heath's day, the Bilderbergers were obviously Ted Heath himself, Sir Alec Douglas Home, Geoffrey Rippon, Sir Keith Joseph, uh, uh, family names, uh, uh, Whitelaw, you know, Willie Whitelaw, Willie Whitelaw, yeah. Um, who are they today? Francis Maud, uh, Ken Clark. One of those two is the real leader of the Conservative Party, and I don't know which one. We'll come back to that later. <laughs> um, okay. And then underneath um, the Bilderbergers, you have. Um, the Freemasons and Common Purpose, who are the foot soldiers of the European Union in England. Uh, most of the 350,000 Freemasons have no idea what secret they are protecting. They go through all these oaths, but they don't know what the secret and the agenda is at the centre. It's only a very small They number. do have all these blood oaths where they say if they ever reveal anything, they, they will rip out their hearts and Correct. have their guts removed yes. and thrown over their shoulder or something, That's don't they? That's right, yeah. And and but you're saying that they don't. So, so a lot of good people might be Freemasons and, and might have perfectly good intent. Is this what you're saying? Absolutely right. And they are all duped by the central core who have uh, a very evil agenda indeed. And it's, it's, surely this is also true of common purpose. I mean, the, I know people in common purpose. Yes. And I don't think that they're necessarily evil. I mean, I think... I, I think it's possible that most people have a propensity to evil given the right circumstances, yes. but... So, so, I don't think they're evil now, necessarily, <laughs> no, are they? So no. they could just be innocent. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, just as over 90% of the 350,000 Freemasons are only there to disguise the central core of the Freemasonry agenda, um, half of common purposes, 40,000 so-called graduates, um, never make it to the inner sanctum, never um, get to do anything except make Common Purpose look like a lovely organisation, and it is not. The aim of Common Purpose is to take control of local government. So the Bilderbergers are taking control of national government, and Common Purpose is taking control of local government and government departments. It controls the output of the BBC, it screens out all anti-EU news from the BBC, which is why people might, like me cannot get on to the BBC. Well, on your website you say that you spend time at the BBC. Yes. So does that mean you have been on the BBC? <laughs> um, yes. I um, don't really want to go into this, but yes, I did actually manage to get myself a job on the inside of the BBC, quite right, yes. OK, well, you put it on your website. OK, let me... Let me uh, I, I, I should say that we have done a programme about Common Purpose on, on this programme uh, with Brian Gerrish, who I know that you worked with That's uh, right, yeah. some time ago. Yeah. So let me start reading out a couple of texts. I've got one here from Mark in Leeds who says, A dictatorship will never happen. The game is finally up for the... I can't read out that words, I'm afraid. Mark, the people of the New World Order. Uh, oh. Joe in Liverpool says, Do you think that John Smith, who was a good man, was murdered because he wouldn't be a Bilderberger? Do you know who that is, John Smith? Yeah, he was uh, briefly leader of the Labour Party. And oh, that John Smith, of course. Yes. He, well, he's deceased, isn't he? Yeah. Yes, and Robin Cook probably. Um, they're very good at uh, encouraging heart attacks, surprise heart attacks in healthy people. If someone drops dead of a heart attack or in America dies in a plane accident, a politician who is anti the, uh, the agenda, those are the sort of questions you need to ask. OK, well, obviously, these are your claims and certainly not made by this programme, I have to say. OK, uh, so... Um, 
Vicky says, I don't understand why there are always documents to show this stuff. If it is that powerful, why bother leaving evidence? The evidence is absolutely overwhelming, and the BBC should be doing this program, should have done it 30 years ago when the first treaty came along. But everything that I'm saying is happening is in EU treaties. There have been six EU treaties well, passed by Parliament and signed by the Queen. Well, the first one was the uh, one that Ted Heath was involved Correct. in. Correct. And uh, we were told that we were going to enter a common market. Yeah, we were lied to. Um, if you read secret documents released from the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, which was the internal government um, illegally foisting the EU on us, um, but under the 30-year rule, they've now released these documents, and uh, it's absolutely clear that Ted, Ted Heath knew he was abolishing Britain and expected the nation to be abolished before the end of this century. Well, if these documents have been revealed, why, don't, why doesn't the press write about it? Why don't they say, you know, that was the agenda from 30 years ago? Or uh, 40, is it 30 or 40 years ago? <laughs> right, the, the press is controlled by a mixture of Freemasons and common purpose, and they never reveal the agenda. But, but these documents, you know, they're all, they've all got numbers like FCO 30 stroke 1048 and FCO 26 12 12. That's what Foreign and Commonwealth Office or something. Correct, yeah. Um, these documents uh, reveal exactly what the government was doing, like they were trailing Enoch Powell and getting advanced copies of his speeches and ridicula ridiculing him in, in public, making him look ridiculous. And um, you know, they were tracking the anti-common market lead. They had civil servants writing into newspapers pretending they were members of the public, lauding the EU. So they spent a total of £461,000 on this campaign to deceive the public, a disinformation campaign. How much? 461000 according to FCO 30, 12, 15. Well, this 26, is 1976, 15. is it? This sort of... No, this is 1970. So in today's 70. money, you're probably talking about sort of 40 million. So we must assume that that, that campaign continued because uh, document FCO 26, 12, 15 is a summary of everything that they did and how to do it better in the future. So we must assume, and we don't, they haven't released any more documents, that that campaign is still going today. And they must be spending 100 million on it to deceive us. Well, I mean, these are very serious um, claims. Let's look at... Uh, uh, no, they're not claims. These are what government documents say. They're not my claims. These are stated by the government. But why would they release them, then, if they're so outrageous because they really thought that in 30 years time it would all be done and dusted well it's very very nearly is isn't it <laughs> well it is but the only good thing about the eu is the time scales always slip a few years so ted heath really thought in 1970 that in 30 years time britain would no longer list, exist therefore the 30-year rule was okay but of course here we are 2010 the, the nation of britain was actually only abolished in legal terms, very dodgy legal terms, um, a year ago. You don't mean the 1st of January this year, you, don't, you mean... Yeah, the nation of Britain was abolished on the 1st of January 2009... 2009, okay. ...by the Lisbon Treaty. Okay. So, and isn't something else going to happen still? Aren't we going to lose even more power in, at some other date this year, or...? Well, now it's just a case of the EU consolidating its power. How quickly can it do that? How quickly can it put our own police and Italian, German, French police on street corners um, with machine guns? Already, all our politicians since the year 2005 have been protected by machine guns. If you go into any MP's office in Westminster, you'll see machine guns. If you go to Portcullis House, which is the main office of MPs in Westminster, there are police with machine guns. You cannot run a dictatorship without protecting your glorious leaders with machine guns. OK, so, so this abolition of the UK, um, what does it mean? What does it really mean? Does it mean that, I mean, right now, we're heading for a general election, aren't we, in May this year, probably May the 6th? 
it's not really a general election because all the political parties are controlled by the European Union. The Conservatives have been EU controlled since the 1960s, the Labour and Lib Dems since 1985, and the BNP and the UKIP leaderships are controlled by the EU as well. Well, you stood as a UKIP MP, didn't you? Yes, and I stood for the leadership of, the, of UKIP as well. But I really am anti-EU, so they couldn't let me get anywhere. It's, it's, that, you know, people will say, listening to this, and with due respect, David, they'll say, well, that's sour grapes, isn't it? You didn't get the job, so now you're dissing them. No, um... This is just a fact. I mean, over the last... 30 years, they have moved thousands of people up into positions of power on the basis of the fact that they're pro-EU. So if you want to be an MEP, you, you couldn't get in uh, without going through the shortlist system, uh, the party list system. And you couldn't get through the party list system unless you were pro-EU. And that is how they got a majority of 138 MPs on the 21st of January 2000 and eight for the Lisbon Treaty and to abolish this nation. And um, they only debated it for two weeks and the Queen signed it into law on the 19th of June 2008 and the Lisbon Treaty abolishing our nation came into effect on the 1st of January 2009. Now you're asking where do we go from here? Well, shall I just, do you mind if I go back into the past a bit? Not at all. Um, the the European Union was not founded by Monet or Salter or Schumann or all the people they try to invent and pretend as being these wonderful benefactors. It was started off by Hermann Goering, who made a speech in 1940 establishing something he called the European Economic Community. And in 1942, there was the first conference of the EEC at Berlin University. This uh, is during the war, then, obviously. Yes, this was the Nazis. Yeah, no, I appreciate that <laughs> Hermann Goering was a Nazi, yes. <laughs> what I'm saying is he had this, he had this conference in, in Berlin yeah. during the Second World War. So, obviously, yes. none of the Allies attended. No. Well, I imagine they didn't. No, no, but it was at that conference that the, the EEC was set in stone. That's where they came up with all the documents were produced then. The common monetary policy, the common economic policy, the common fisheries policy, the common agricultural policy, the whole thing was set in stone at that conference in Berlin in 1942, and it hasn't changed since, except one thing. What was the one thing? I haven't got there yet. <laughs> <laughs> OK. In 1943, von Ribbentrop um, held the first summit of the European Union. He was a German chancellor, wasn't he? Or... Yes, deeply involved with uh, Nancy Astor and the royal family, our royal family. But the uh, Gotha Sachs Coburgs. Correct. Otherwise known as Windsor. Correct. The Germans. <laughs> so, um, uh, <clears throat> 13 nations, not us, attended the first summit of the EEC in Germany mm -hmm. under von Ribbentrop. And um, in uh, 1944, at the Rotes House Hotel in Strasbourg, um, the more enlightened members of the Nazi high command had a meeting with big German companies included, like IG Farben, um, where they commissioned the European Union to carry forward German ambitions um, because they could see defeat looming. And Hitler himself commissioned the Deutsche Verteidigungsdienst Intelligence Department to control future development of the European Union. And um, in 1946, that one change you wanted to know about, you couldn't sell Nazism to anyone in 1946, so they switched the European Union from a Nazi to a communist basis, and it's been communist ever since. And um, in 1958, Ted Heath, Geoffrey Rippon, and Roy Jenkins were recruited by the Deutsche Verteidigungsdienst Intelligence Department as agents for the EEC before Germany. Were they paid agents? I think, I don't think they were paid. I think they did it because of uh, misguided feelings of self-importance and grandeur. 
I have to say at this point that these are the opinions of my guests and not necessarily the opinions <laughs> of this show. Um, do you have any proof of this? Um, well, if you look at um, the World Reports um, newsletter, they've done quite a lot of uh, investigation into it. And uh, it does completely explain why those three got on so well together and why they were so keen to push these treaties through. I mean, Jeffrey Rippon actually signed one of the treaties, well, the first one. And, of course, Ted Heath orchestrated the whole thing. Why would you want to abolish your, your nation? Well, if you were Kim Philby or Burgess or Maclean, you would, you would want to do that sort of thing. Well, actually, Ted Heath... Jeffrey Ripp and Roy Jenkins were very similar people. Well, uh, yes, but they, they worked for the Soviet Union, and, the, and what's left of the Soviet Union, Russia, is not part of the EU, is it? And they're not likely to become part of the EU, not, not in the short term, anyway. Well, that was the original plan in 1917. They, they were hoping to create one Soviet uh, state right through Europe. But, it, but instead, I mean, at the end of the Cold War, the Soviet Union itself broke up, didn't it? And all those places like Ukraine and yes. Belarus and all those places yes. became yes. nominally independent. Yes. It still is the agenda that those, w those two bodies will get together. The Soviet Union and the European Soviet will get together as one. That always has been their plan. And China? No. Not That's China? Not, not part of the same grouping. That's going to be some other... Yes. It's a bit George Orwell, isn't it? Yes, George Orwell was a stunning prophet. He was amazingly accurate. OK, so let me just sort of drive down to the nub of this then. What you're saying is that effectively um, Britain no longer exists? Um, no, we still exist in the same way that Hungary or Czechoslovakia or Poland existed under the Soviet Union inside the Warsaw Pact. So we're not a nation as such on our own. Or if you want to look at the American side of things, you know, we are sort of as relevant as the state of Ohio is to the USA. And it's not that... I mean, they have... European Union has produced maps without the word England or Britain on it. They clearly don't want us to exist. But our constitution has been replaced by the six EU treaties. So the Brit British constitution which is written, that's a Frankfurt School subversion technique, to get us all thinking the British Constitution isn't written, but it is written. Well, ever since Magna Carta, you exactly. mean, that, that was written, wasn't yeah. it? And the Bill of Rights. Exactly, 1689, the whole thing's written. But they've been telling us it's not written, so that we think, oh, well, we'd better let Gordon Brown introduce another one. But our Constitution is written. But actually, the Constitution, they dropped that because everyone made a, made a fuss. So they brought in the Lisbon Treaty, which was the Constitution. I believe I'm correct in saying that, largely. Right, hang on, I'm talking about the the British Constitution, so they dropped the EU's Constitution and incorporated it in the six treaties. A mm -hmm. lot of it was already in the first five treaties, they just put the rest of it into Lisbon. So the EU Constitution is wholly contained in the six treaties that the Queen has signed. And the important thing to remember is that as far as they are concerned, the EU Constitution takes primacy over the British Constitution, which is their way of saying Actually, the British Constitution doesn't exist anymore. Only the EU Constitution has existed since the 1st of January 2009. So why are we having an election in May? To... Actually, no, go on. <laughs> We're about to go to a break, but I'll let you quickly introduce that. Um, because there are 62 million people in Britain who don't know what's going on, and only about a quarter of a million, many of whom will be um, watchers of this programme, who do know what's going on, and they need to keep the 62 million fooled long enough until the EU has consolidated its power. And then they say, well, we don't need a parliament anymore. Is that what Correct. you're suggesting? Yeah. So Westminster will become a hotel or something? Probably, probably knock it down and make a... A regional council or... No, I should think they'll make a hospital out of it. A hospital. Knock it down. There's one, the, there's one the other side of the river. <laughs> anyway, we're going for a break now. If you'd like to text in your questions or comments for David Noakes, please do so now to 87778 with the word EDGE, and then your text. See you back here very soon. <music> Welcome back to On the Edge with me, Theo Chalmers, and my special guest, David Noakes. So, David, um, 
The most recent uh, treaty, the, the final mm. treaty, if you like, mm. uh, that we've signed that makes us part of Europe, uh, apparently irrevocably, is the Lisbon Treaty. Correct. Yeah. What does that say? Well, some really quite stunning things. For example, page 18, article 9, uh, defines the executive of the European Union, and that is a three-tier, unelected politburo. Uh, that's ex exactly what you have in, in, in the Soviet Union, except that was uh, only a one-tier, unelected politburo, but it's still now three unelected politburos. Politicians choose our leaders, okay? But aren't they elected, the politicians? Well, no, none of the commissioners are elected, none of the councillors are elected. Um, the top council is the council of prime ministers. But of course it is the 27 prime ministers of the European Union who dragged us into the European Union in the first place. People like Gordon Brown are not only Bilderbergers, bought, but they are bought, paid and owned by the, by the European Union. So. Um, but that doesn't the fact that he's elected, firstly, into the Labour Party as a, as a member of Parliament, and secondly, elected by the other members of Parliament as, or the other members of the Labour Party as their leader, mm. doesn't that mean that there is a democratic process of sorts? None whatsoever, no. Um, l let me just give you an example of the power of the Bilderbergers. Margaret Thatcher was a Bilderberger. She had to be, or she couldn't be uh, leader of the Conservative Party and Prime Minister. Uh, but she was a naive Bilderberger, and towards the end of her reign, she realised that the Bilderbergers were building the EU dictatorship, and she made her Bruges speech, and she switched side. She actually came onto our side. Within two months, she was out on the street and a compliant builder, Bilderberger, John Major, in her place. Now that's eight Bilderbergers on the Conservative Central Committee who threw her out. That's how much power they have. They decide who will be leader of the party, they decide who we can vote for, and we can only vote for one of them. And if someone looks popular, he'll be invited to, in, to join. If he won't join, he won't become Prime Minister. So who can be the next Prime Minister of this country? Well, um, Ed Balls can be, David Miliband can be. No one else can be um, because they're not Bilderbergers. And but what if they looked popular and got invited? Oh yeah, they can, they can get invited. Uh, this is what happened to Herman van Rompuy of... of uh, oh, the Dutch... No, he's a Dutch or Belgian? Belgium. 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 He was the Belgian Prime Minister and he's now... President. President of the <laughs> EU dictatorship. And he is uh, what is uh, kindly called a federalist, i.e. he believes heart and soul in the EU dictatorship, but he looks like a kindly pair of hands while the EU consolidates its, its power. He isn't a kindly pair of hands at all. And then they appointed this apparently English woman, Lady Catherine Ashton, who took the communist route up through um, government quangos and government agencies on huge salaries at our expense. And she was the bitch who forced the I Lisbon Treaty... I have to warn you about language here, <laughs> David. Uh, she, she pushed the, the Lisbon Treaty through the House of Lords. She is the traitor that pushed the Lisbon Treaty through the House of Lords, and she is now the EU's foreign minister. So they're a very nasty pair. OK, so the Lisbon Treaty. Right. So it is an unelected Politburo. That is the leadership of the, the EU. Um, page 16, Article uh, 8A4. Uh, political parties at the European level contribute to forming European political awareness and to expressing the will of the citizens of the Union. Well, they've already defined political parties of the European Union level being parties with voters in more than 10 countries. The Conservative, Labour, Lib Dem, UKIP and BNP parties only have voters in one country. Well, three, <laughs> you could argue. Yeah, but they can, they can all be abolished under that clause.
If they need to, they have the power under the Lisbon Treaty to abolish our political parties. And any political party that opposes the European Union can be abolished under EU Court of Justice uh, uh, case 274-99, where it is held that it is blasphemy to, um, to oppose the European Union. So, bla isn't blasphemy a religious term? Well, this is sort of an, in their agenda, a religious crusade. So are you saying that the, tr the Lisbon Treaty says that you cannot criticise the European Union? No, that's the European Court of Justice. I use the term justice loosely because this is the Court of Justice that uh, when Martha Andreessen was fired for revealing the fact that the European Union cannot account for 95% of its expenditure. She was the European Union's budget director at the time, so she should know. That's not 5% of the expenditure of the European Union it can't account for. That's 95% of the expenditure. There isn't, there isn't one business in England that can't account for 95% of its expenditure, but the European Union can't. So uh, when she revealed this... She was fired. And it wasn't her pension removed as well. <laughs> The European Court of Justice held that because she had tol told the truth, her firing was right and proper, and she had forfeited her right to her pension. That is the European Court of Justice. And uh, they that is are truly <laughs> disgraceful, isn't it? <laughs> and they if are that is true. If oh, that's that the is case. absolutely true. And they are <clears throat> the same court that enforces the Lisbon Treaty. So when they enforce justice on Martha Andreessen like that, and when they are given the remit that they have to, interpret the treaties uh, under the remit of ever closer union, you can see just how biased that court is going to be. Well, uh, yes, but I suppose, are you saying then that, that all these things are kind of waiting in the wings? They're all, they're all part of British law now. Are you saying that right now we're going through a sort of softly, softly catchy monkey period where it's, you know, they're kind of being a bit sotto voce and not, not saying, I mean, for instance, by, your, by what you just said, for instance, they could say tomorrow, right, in the coming general election, we don't, A, they could say we don't need a general election because Parliament is abolished, B, they could say in any event, uh, the Conservative Party, the, the Liberal Democrats and the mm. Labour Party and any other party is abolished because it doesn't have voters in ten yes, nations. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so and they could say all of those things, but they're not going to do that quite yet. Exactly right, yes. And, of course, there is no provision in the uh, Lisbon Treaty for elections to a West Westminster Parliament, so they could re rule the whole thing illegal on that basis because there's no constitutional basis for Westminster anymore. Um, not a lot of people are aware that the European Union is a military dictatorship, and there's scores of clauses all through the six treaties. For example, page 39 of Lisbon, clause 10a, c3. Member states shall make civil, civilian and military capabilities available for the, to, to the European Union. Uh, member states shall understate, undertake progressively to improve their military capabilities. So we're looking at three unelected politburos controlling the nuclear weapons of the former nations of Britain and France. And when you put dictators in charge of armies, you always get war. Well, we, <laughs> we're doing quite well in any event, aren't we, in terms of wars? You know, we're, we're having quite a few. Yes. Unless you notice. <laughs> yes, but I think we're talking on a much larger scale here. Really? Yes. We're, we're being trained. The government is training us to dis dislike Muslims and Arabs. That tells us where their first war's going to be. Well, Iran, is that what yeah. you're saying? Yeah. The, the Middle East. I'm quite sure of it. Okay. Um, <laughs> it is quite a shocking <laughs> set of statistics and information, isn't it? This. I mean. Yes, and and the most stunning thing of it is it's all written down and signed by the Queen. You know, um, I mean, in in the Lisbon Treaty, we're allowed to have petitions. If we can get a million people to sign a petition, we are allowed to have a petition. But the petition, they tell us what we must ask for. In that petition of our, you know, our own wishes, what we want, we have to want ever closer union of the European Union. That is the only thing we're allowed to petition for. 
That is very Soviet, isn't it? It is. <laughs> <laughs> And that is clause uh, 17, 8B4. And we voted this in, did we? The, uh, well, we didn't get a referendum, as you know, but the, the, our, our elected uh, mm. members of parliament voted for this. Yeah. By the way, any political party that is campaigning for a referendum, you know immediately is working for the European Union because we will never be allowed a referendum. So if they're campaigning for a referendum, they know they're completely safe because we can never have one. Angela Merkel wouldn't allow it. Our government wouldn't allow it, the European Union won't allow it. We cannot have a referendum, nor can Germany, because the Germans are as anti the EU as we are. And they will never let the Germans have a vote, because the last thing the Germans want is another expansion of German ambitions well, it... with, with the EU as the vehicle, because 10 million Germans died in the last war. Everyone forgets that. They absolutely hate the idea of, of, of this, a similar dictatorship rising again. But the Irish had a vote. Well, they had two, didn't they? <laughs> they, get, they gave the wrong answer the first time, clearly. I went to Ireland and I was knocking on doors, wasting my time, because every door I knocked on, they were absolutely dead against the Lisbon Treaty. I didn't have to explain anything to them. They were dead against it. So how did they vote yes then? I don't think they did. I think the government fiddled it by 40%. Because why? Because they I know that the, the, all the votes were taken into custody for 48 hours before they were counted or something exactly. like that. Yes. And it's, it's happening more and more. I mean, the American elections were fiddled. Firstly, with the Diebold machine. Oh, no, the hanging yeah. chads and then the, the, with the... Yeah, the chads first yeah, and Diebold We've talked about that on yeah. programmes. Uh, yeah. Cynthia McKinney there. Yeah. Former Congresswoman. And, and they actually did a recount. The press funded a recount in Florida and found that George Bush's brother Jeb had deliberately lost a quarter of a million Democratic votes. And actually, uh, George Bush's presidency was entirely illegal because he declared his brother the, the, the leader, by, the president, with only a 537 margin. And actually, it went a quarter of a million the other way. And the newspapers started to publish their findings and then were stopped. So if they're fiddling votes there, I'm sure they're fiddling votes over here. So, um, <laughs> we're stuffed, is that right? Um, I do plan to tell everyone what, what to do at the end. Um, we're not actually stuffed, and this should be the most fun fight of all, fighting for our own freedom. There is a lot we can do but we do need at least 10,000 people. And well, we'll do, we'll, what we'll do, we'll do that in the last section well, of the show, no, I think. No, no, this, well. is, this is another topic. The point is, not only have they moved 30,000 people up into all positions of power, so all our law lords have been chosen because of... You know, they are either prepared to break the law or they are prepared to turn a blind eye to the EU. All our ministers have been selected exclusively because they are prepared to be pro-EU more than half of our MPs. It goes right through our government, the BBC, everything. But down at the lower levels, they're getting at small organisations, like the General Osteopathic Council, you wouldn't think, the Women's Institute. Any organisation that's got more than 5,000 members, you're finding that the good leadership is being violently ejected, uh, often sort of fairly illegally, and corrupt people who can be controlled. Well, again, I have to say that is your opinion and not necessarily the opinion of this show. Well, I will <laughs> say that uh, the General Osteopathic Council has been uh, very deeply um, investigated by Julia Spivak, who's laid a report in, in at the police, um, because there's, it looks like there's criminal activity. And uh, I think we have to be careful here of uh, yeah, I, I injunctions and... and, yes. and you know, yes. libel and so uh, on. I, I understand, but um, so I this is prefer th you not to make but, but, those kind of accusations but, on this show. But anybody that has enough members to make a difference is having its leadership replaced by corrupt people who can be controlled. So who's going to organise this? Now, you know, there are more than a dozen campaigns that would be really effective that 10,000 people could do but there isn't any political party that's doing it. Why? Because the leaderships aren't working to get us out of the European Union.
Okay, uh, here's a question from Sarah in Suffolk. It's been reported that UKIP will not stand at the next general election, but might do a deal with the Tories. Is that true? It doesn't make a blind bit of difference either way. They're both controlled by the European Union. Why bother to ask the question? Okay. Uh, Charlie in Coventry says, does this mean no more common law? Where does this leave free men on the land? Isn't all this statute? Right. Um, common law was replaced by European Union common uh, corpus juris in 1992. Corpus juris puts the government above the law. The police have shot dead 30 people since 1992, including that uh, electrician. John Charles de Menezes. Yes, Menezes. he was the highest profile case. Yeah. Um, they've also killed, according to their own records, which they publish as PDF documents, so you can read them, mm -hmm. in custody the police since 1992 have killed no less than 1,100 people. That's 30 shots. That's the British police? The British police, yeah. This is in Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland? Correct, and yes. And, the, yeah. and England, yes. Yeah. Not one successful prosecution has ever been brought against the police for any of these murders and deaths. Why? Because under corpus juris, the government is above the law. So it is now practically impossible to prosecute a policeman for anything. That is how much corpus juris has taken over. There is no such thing as habeas corpus. There's the memory of it. We don't have it, not under corpus juris. Fortunately, if you can get in front of a jury, virtually no jury knows that, so you might still get it. But actually, it doesn't exist anymore. The whole of common law has gone. I mean, interestingly, in, that, in, the, um, in the autopsy, not the autopsy, in the, um, uh, the John Charles de Menezes um, yeah. inquest, mm. Uh, the jury was directed that it couldn't bring in a verdict of unlawful killing, wasn't it? Yes, that's right. That's because the government is controlling it, and the government is acting criminally and illegally. Okay. Well, should we talk about treason? Okay. What level do you want to start at? Do you want to start at the top or the bottom? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we should start at the top. <laughs> We've probably upset a few people already, or you have. So um... let's go for it then. Right. Um, well, be, 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 I should say, be mindful <laughs> of the laws of libel, please. All right. Well, von Ribbentrop was having an affair with Nancy Astor. That's fine. They're both dead. Yes. And the Clifton set, Mosley, the leader of the British Union of Dead. Fascists. Yes, gone. Yep. And the royal family were all very much together. They were all Nazis. Germans. The royal family, as you very well know, is German. It was George III who took over from the Stuarts in 1750, was it? Something like that. And um, they are a German family, and they spoke only German until this century. Um, and the, the king, which, which king was it? It was Edward VIII, who... He was the wartime king. He, he, well, no, it was George VI. Sorry. Yep. <laughs> he yes, sorry, he right. was forced to abdicate with Mrs. Simpson as the excuse yeah. because he was too rabid a Nazi to be allowed to be king when we were going to war with Hitler. And... Um, the whole family were Nazi, with the one exception of George VI. No one ever thought he was going to be king because he stuttered and he was a bit further down the list. And so they didn't bother to indoctrinate him in Nazi principles. And so he came to be king, and he and Churchill did a bang-up job in um, keeping us free for another 60 years. That's all it was, only another 60 years. Um, but, of course, in 1946, they switched the EU from a Nazi basis to a communist basis. And so our queen was educated by her tutor, Sir Henry Martin, from the age of 12 to the age of 22 in Fabian communism. And that is why our queen has been so happy and so delighted to sign all six EU treaties and it, she couldn't wait to sign Lisbon. It does seem um, counterintuitive that a monarch would 
favour a communist policy because, you know, vanilla communism doesn't include a royal family, does it? I mean, the Soviet Union didn't have a royal family. The Romanovs were killed yeah. by the, the communists yes. in, in yes. 1917. So yes. how can that be? How can, you know, how can our royal family be communist? How can they be keen on abolishing themselves? Unless, um, of course, they're going to become queen or king of, <laughs> of Europe. Is that what you're suggesting? Will, will William become king of Europe? That's another subject. That's... I don't want to get into that just yet. Um, <clears throat> why do they do it? They're not like us. Um, they've had so much grace, favour, wealth, riches. They don't think like us. And to them, being queen may not be the biggest thing on this earth. Um, the Queen's broken every single one of her coronation oaths, since, including her ones to the Church of England, which um, will almost certainly be abolished and rolled up into the Roman Catholic Church, which will be the Church of the European Union. Because, uh, reading really on your website, you say that the European Union is, is um, a religious, if you like. It's, it has no, it's not a Christian mm. society or a yeah. Muslim or mm. any other kind of society. Yes. It's, it has no religion, no... Yes. It's not a, like, you know, England is traditionally a Christian yes. society, isn't it? I don't want to get too deeply into this, but, but basically, um, the Roman Catholics have the Queen of Heaven, who is a, a Babylonian uh, goddess, a satanic Babylonian goddess, who's pro prohibited in the Old Testament. And the only picture of her is um, a wo woman in profile with a blue background and 12 gold stars. That is where the EU flag comes from. And I don't want to get into this now, but there is... This agenda has been around for a long time, and... Um, so, sorry, who, who was that? Who was in this, this image? The Queen of Heaven. The Queen of... Is, is this Minerva or something, or...? No, she's just referred to in, in the Bible and in old scripts as the Queen of, Queen of Heaven. Okay. And uh, it's... It's a Roman Catholic Babylonian, um, and that's where the flag comes from. Okay. Then they keep adding stars as more members <laughs> join. No, no, no. They, a lot of people wanted to, and they point blank refused to go above 12 because 12 is what is, is, is on that picture. Because the Americans, of course, when they kept buying mm. territories like yes. Louisiana Purchase, yeah. they kept adding stars, yeah. didn't they? Mm. Couldn't add any more stripes because it would have looked like a, a <laughs> yep. pinstripe shirt, but That's they right, wanted yeah. to add lots of stars. Mm. Okay. Yep. So you, you're kind of getting off the subject then, really, of, of, of treason. You know, are you saying that, that the, the Queen has committed uh, okay, treason well, for a motive then? Yeah. Um, there's no question that the Queen has committed treason. No question at all. Uh, every every uh, prime minister or minister, anyone who signed an EU treaty has committed treason. There's no, absolutely no question about it. And they got a bit nervous about this in 1998. So after the MPs debated the uh, uh, Crime and Disorder Bill of 1998, Tony Blair added a clause repealing chunks of the treason acts. Because, of course, both he and the Queen should have hung by the neck, neck till dead. And I wish both of them still do. I just would be so happy if all these people had commit, who've committed treason were to hang by the neck till dead, particularly the Queen. I'm going to have to say it again, I'm afraid. <laughs> these are the opinions of my guests and not necessarily the opinions of this company or this show or this programme. Thank you. <laughs> so, um, yes, treason has been committed. Now, in theory... Um, the maximum they can do is life imprisonment. But, of course, they committed this before uh, the laws were repealed. So, actually, they are still guilty of treason. Because they're not... Ret you can't, you know, retroactively say, retrospectively say that... Correct. ..something that was illegal when you did it is yeah. no longer a crime. Sorry, sorry, it's not that they're still guilty of treason. It is that they can still hang by the neck till get dead. Because they were guilty of treason when it was still... a. Uh, a, a hanging penalty. offence. Hanging yep. offence. Hanging offence. Right. Um, <laughs> we're going to go for another break now. Oh, once again, if you'd like to text in your questions or comments for David Noakes, please send a text to 8777 with the word edge and then your text. 
See you soon. Welcome back to On The Edge with me, Theo Chalmers, and my special guest, David Noakes. So, David, just before the break then, we were talking about uh, treason and why the royal family would want to bring in a communist-style regime. We didn't quite get to the bottom of that, did we, I don't think? All right, well, um, <clears throat> communism is favoured by wealthy bankers. So it was a Rothschild in 1917 who financed the um, communist revolution in, in the Soviet Union. And the theory behind that is that if you get a communist government ruthlessly controlling the people, the bankers own the government and therefore the bankers own the whole lot. And the Queen is at that level. She's at the level where she can control through a communist go government and own more through a communist government than she does now. So she wouldn't be the queen then of Europe or even of the UK anymore. She would just be, you know, living in Monaco or somewhere. <laughs> Monarco, yes. as they'd have to rename it. Yeah. Um, mm. Just mm. having a, you know, having lots of lifestyle yes. and not having to open fates or whatever yes. she does. Yes. I mean, one really interesting thing is that the Bank of England is not owned by us. It's owned by a company called the Bank of England Nominees Limited. And it's exempted from the disclosure requirements of the Companies Acts. Profits and loss and directors. Everything. And, and, yes. Shareholders are yeah. completely exempt. So um, we don't know who owns that company. And when an MP asked the question, why are you exempting that company, the answer came back, because certain royal personages do not want their identity to be known. Well, if it isn't our own royal person, I mean, surely it wouldn't be the Queen of the Netherlands that owns the Royal Bank of England. Surely it would be the Queen the, of England. This was an actual owns. question in Parliament. Oh yes, it? yes, absolutely. Yeah. And that was the, the answer. Surely they would say, "Well, that's what, you know, that's what it, what's so." Why would they say certain royal personages? No, that was the reply. Mm -hmm. okay. um, now the biggest shareholder in the Federal Reserve, interestingly enough, the American government does not own the American dollar. It is owned by 13 private banking families. And this was in 1913 they passed the Federal Reserve Act? 1913, yeah. Yeah. Um, and the Rothschilds family are the biggest shareholders in the Federal Reserve. They own the dollars, not the US government. Mm -hmm. And uh, before the Bank of England went secret, the Rothschilds were the biggest shareholders then so it would appear that the Queen and the Rothschilds own the Bank of England so um, it may be that she has interests that are of far more interest to her than just being Queen I mean, maybe she's tired of being Queen I don't know I can't possibly speculate on her behalf but it does sound like a bit of a boring day job doesn't it <laughs> going around shaking hands well, and well, well, opening things <laughs> It's a family institution, and their aims are not our aims. The, the monarchy is, a, is an institution of the saxe coburg gotha family, all of them, and their aims are not ours. Okay, well, what about the other traitors? Then you talked about traitors. You might as well um, mention some others that you feel have, have been uh, mm. treasonous. Okay, well, I mean... Ted Heath was obviously um, the, a particularly interesting case. Bilderberger, Deutsche Verteidensdienst Intelligence Department, an agent. Who are the DVD agents today? Well, we won't know till their deaths, but probably it's the likes of uh, Francis Maud, Francis Maud, the MP for Horsham, Ken Clark, um, and um, in the Labour Party, I would think. Miliband, Mandelson, they are the likely candidates, but we won't know till their deaths. And these people are 
literally agents for a foreign power. But then surely that foreign power becomes this power eventually. Uh, if we are truly part of this huge Europe, surely they, they can then say, well, we weren't agents for a foreign power because it's now, you know, Britain is now part of that power. Um, yeah, that's the nasty thing about it, isn't it? I mean, firstly, the EU is completely illegal under the British Constitution in every area. All six treaties are completely illegal. So everybody who signed those treaties, like John Major, yes. Margaret Thatcher, yes. uh, Tony Blair, yes. Gordon Brown... Yes, they're, they're guilty of criminal acts and they're guilty of treason. Why can't you just go to a police station and <laughs> report them, then? If that were the case, and right. I'm not saying that it is, of course. Because they have moved up um, uh, tens of thousands of people into all positions of power. All our law lords are corrupt. Our British courts are now utterly corrupt. It is almost impossible to get a decent verdict out of a the court these days. There are more miscarriages of justice than there are fair cases. The courts are used to snatch four and a half thousand children a year from good parents by social workers it creates trauma through injustice. I think it, we need uh, to keep off that subject because that's subject probably for another program, okay. to be honest with Fair you. Enough. I mean, yeah. I've got a text here from someone called Doc saying, Ted Heath, a German agent, what nonsense. Well, look at what he did. I mean, you, you know, who does our government at Westminster represent? What do they do? They pass EU laws, EU regulations, um, EU treaties, they implement EU policy. They don't implement anything that we want. We don't want this EU stuff, we've never voted for it. Between 50 and 80% of us in polls are against it. So who does our government at Westminster represent? Well, not us, it obviously... Well, two million marched against the war in Iraq and... Yes. We still went to war. Yes. So Westminster obviously doesn't represent us. So who does it represent? It obviously represents the people it's acting for, the European Union. Now, look at Ted Heath. Who was he working for? He wasn't working for us. He abolished our nation. So who was he working for? Well, he was a Bilderberger. So he was obviously working for the European Union. I mean, but, that goes But Bilderbergers are not, not just Europeans. I mean, Americans, you know, Clinton and... Uh, Bush were Bilderbergers, or are Bilderbergers, mm. so, and that's not part of Europe, is it? No. No. The, the New World Order agenda uh, <clears throat> covers both sides of the Atlantic. Both nations, they want to bring down both nations. The EU dictatorship cannot be built while there is a strong, freedom-loving Britain on its doorstep, because we stopped them twice before. They know they've got to bring Brit Britain and America down first, and they're using traitors on the inside to do it. So, <clears throat> yes, uh, in 1999, um, Britain and America, at the same time, deregulated the banks, knowing that they would create massive bubbles that would eventually burst and ruin our economy. And this is why we've not been allowed into the euro. Gordon Brown's five tests to keep us out of the euro weren't Gordon Brown's five tests. They were the European Union's test, tests to keep us out of the euro. Because if they want to destroy us, it's far easier to keep us separate in sterling and destroy Britain and sterling than it is to have us inside the euro. And when they try and destroy us with 120,000 regulations, they're going to damage the euro. So you're far saying, more convenient to keep us outside. So you're saying that the next plan is to destroy the pound? Yes. They have no intention of letting us into the euro. Never did. Well, eventually, I suppose, if they've destroyed the pound, then we become... Part of the Eurozone, is that? No, no, no. Well, never. We're always going to have a weak pound. No, we're just going to be in poverty. The pound's going to be worthless and we're going to be in poverty. That is their plan. Now, well, they've destroyed our, well, I don't know who, but we've, we seem to have lost our manufacturing base. Our, <coughs> our mining has gone. You know, that was Margaret Thatcher, wasn't it? Yes. Destroyed yep. natural resource yes. exploitation. In the European Union, we are designated as a tourist economy because they know we cannot survive. That's not tourist <coughs> in the George W. Bush sense. <coughs> <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't resist that. OK, so we're a tourist economy. Yeah, but we people are, are not going to the whole of the UK for their tourist visits, are they? They're only going to a few mm. 
Yeah, Obvious they know we place. can't survive under tourism, but that's, we are designated as a tourist economy in the EU. We are not allowed manufacturing. They want the, the wealth of manufacturing in continental Europe. They want it in Germany. They may want it in France, but they do not want it in England. So that's why we've been forced to close down our manufacturing. The Rover Car Company was closed down by the European Union. 400 million went missing. The Rover Car Company was sold to friends of Tony Blair for 10 pounds. Yeah. Uh, the Phoenix, they formed a little company called the Phoenix Corporation and, yeah. and, and bought it for 10 quid. Mm. <clears throat> they took 17 million out in salaries in the first year and Rover had a hole in it of 400 million that had just disappeared. And, um, <clears throat> uh, of course, what would normally happen is the 400 that had been taken would be replaced by the government to keep our, uh, one of our major car companies going. But no, we weren't allowed to under European competition rules. Now, these competition rules do not apply in Europe. Renault and Citroën can have as much um, aid as they want. It's like, we're Britain. It's Britain that has to be destroyed. It's Britain that's not allowed a manufacturing industry. And Margaret Thatcher did a bang-up job of closing down manufacturing, manufacturing on behalf of the European Union. It was her job as a Bilderberger. Mm, OK. Let's, let's talk about the Frankfurt School, because I know you want to talk about the Frankfurt School. Yeah. First of all, what is the Frankfurt School? In <clears throat> 1935, the Soviet Union bosses, the Stalins of this world, were getting concerned that the workers of the world weren't uniting and losing their chains and picking up the chains of the European Union because they really thought that they would, through revolution, end up ruling the whole world, the, the Soviet bosses. Mm -hmm. So they bought, well, they actually invested in the sociology department of the German Frankfurt University and commissioned them to write, they renamed it the Frankfurt School, and commissioned them to write um, reports on how to sabotage nations. And these guys did a bang-up job. They started with the 24 Protocols of Zion and came up with 200 Frankfurt School subversion techniques. Are you saying that they wrote the Protocols of Zion? No, no, no. They, they just you know, took a copy of those as a base to start with. The Protocols of Zion were about 40 years older. Okay. And um, <clears throat> we won't, I don't think it's worth debating whether those were genuine or anything else about them because that's a whole other topic. Well, who, isn't who it? cares? They work, they're brilliant. And um, they, the European Union started applying these in Britain in the 1950s. So the first thing was to empty the churches. That's the Frankfurt School subversion technique because if you get people to stop believing in religion, you can then fill them up with. With, with other Frankfurt School subversion techniques like mindless TV, football, um, reality TV shows, mm -hmm. all Frankfurt School subversion techniques to stop people thinking. Okay, let me just ask you a question here. Mr. Crowley in Essex says, Hi Theo, can you please ask your guest if he is a Christian fundamentalist? What are his religious views? Thanks. <laughs> well, it seems like an appropriate time to ask that question. Are you coming at this from a religious perspective? Um, I was a Christian, but I have been totally disappointed. You've been dis totally <laughs> God disappointed. God hasn't blessed you then, clearly. <laughs> no. okay. I doesn't answer prayers. I mean, the, the thing that really gets me about Christianity is, is in the Church of England, ever since the 1950s, we have been praying that our Queen will rule us wisely in accordance with our laws and constitution. Now, that's 20 million people every Sunday, right, for 50 years. That adds up to 2.5 billion prayers that God ignored. And what have we got? A queen that has abolished not just our constitution, but our entire nation. So all those prayers are wasted. So that's it for me. OK, so if God is watching, uh, that is not necessarily the opinion of this show either. <laughs> OK, so getting back to the Frankfurt School. So their, their plan was to dismantle society as we know it. Yes. Is that what you're saying? Yes. So by making us not go to church, breaking up families, was that...? Y yeah, the attack on fathers and the families, um, corruption of the courts. The courts are completely controlled by Freemasonry. It's practically impossible to find a judge or a barrister who isn't a Freemason, so they're putting 
that they're judging cases on the basis of the Freemasonry agenda, not on the basis of justice. Okay. And so they're being successful then? You think this, the Frankfurt uh, School the policies are is successful? Um, stunningly successful. I mean, um, you know, the encouraging encouragement of drinking, so we've got 24-hour drinking, that's the Frankfurt School subversion technique. Feminism. And teenage prostitution. Yes. And all that kind um, of stuff. Single-parent families. Um, and brainwashing by the media. And isn't it interesting, interesting I was reading something about uh, uh, pornography. You can sell it to children in this country because they, they fudged the law, but mm. only in this country. Mm. Yes. Oh, that's another Frankfurt School subversion technique, of course. The teaching of sex and homosexuality to under tens as the Frankfurt School subversion technique. And there are 200 of these, and they've been stunningly successful. And you know, we now have the highest sort of uh, abortion rate, the highest teenage agency pregnant, pregnancy rate. Our families are breaking apart. We've got divorce left, right and centre. They're trying to stop homeschooling for those who teach their children yes. at home. Yes. That can't be allowed anymore, obviously. Correct. Yeah. But it does seem like, you know, some elements of this Frankfurt mm. School do seem to be in our society, I think. Yes. Uh, all of it. It's, it's all been stunningly successful. I mean, the thing that amazes me is that, is that uh, we've gone on as long as we can. It does take an awful lot to destroy an economy. Uh, when we went into the European Union, we were the third largest economy in the world. We're still the fifth largest. That's another Frankfurt School subversion technique, by the way, to be told that our nation is too small to survive on its own. Everyone's been saying this. Um, well, we're the, still the fifth largest economy in the world, which means there are 200 economies, 200 nations in the world, smaller than us. So if we can't survive on our own, that means there's, uh, there's 200 nations smaller than us who can't survive, and only five that can. And it's utter rubbish. And what about the cost? What about the cost that we're paying huge amounts to Europe every day, aren't we? Oh, forget that. That's minor. Oh, that's tiny. Let's look at the real costs. Um, there are now 8,500... EU quangos in Britain, that is quangos that we have had to open because the EU wants them. Um, according to the Cabinet Office, who also state that the cost of them in, 19, in 2007 was 167 billion. That's 12% of our entire economy of one, uh, 1,330 trillion. 12% of our economy is quangos, quangos. European quangos. Not, these are not the old British quangos that we know and love. Yeah, these, you're, these, you're saying these are like new, these, well, foreign-accented uh, uh, quangos. Yeah, these are quangos that have grown up in the last 10 years. Okay. Yeah, 10, 15 years. Um, add to that, according to the government's Better Regulation Commission, um, we spend a hundred billion a year on EU regulations. Add those two figures together, you get 267 billion wasted on Europe. I, I, I just thought it might be worth explaining exactly what a quango is before we go on. Right, it's um, global warming quangos are the... Well, the word quango the, means quasi-autonomous, yes. non-governmental organization, yeah. doesn't it? Yeah, so a quango is... is um, it's, it's a government body that is funded by the government but has its own sort of board of directors. And they're all over the place. You know, the area of outstanding natural beauty quango where people get paid 300 grand a year to stand on cliff walks and have pictures taken of them. It's the most ridiculous one I can think of at the top of my head at the moment. But, but basically, quangos are a bribery structure. You bribe influential people with 300,000 a year salaries um, to turn a blind eye to the encroachment of the European Union. To, they are effectively bought placement in government. They are patronage. And um, when you think that the total amount spent on benefit the dole, all kinds of benefits, is a tiny fraction of that. But anyway, so we've got 100 billion wasted on EU regulations according to the... Um, Better Regulation Commission annual report forward by Tony Blair, so we know that's a government figure. And um, we've lost at least 40 billion um, annually with the closing down of companies uh, because of European regulation. The most 
daft regulation now is that car paint shops have to use water-based paints, children's paints, to, to repair cars with. Mm -hmm. so and, and cars, when they're new, from the factory have got water-based mm -hmm. paints, quite a few of them. Yeah. So that means that your average sort of two-man-in-a-garage car, car repair shop has gone out of business because only the massive ones can make this ridiculous paint stick. You've got to have massive facilities. So every little bump you have in a car now is a thousand pounds to fix because it's only a big company and a huge process that can actually paint your car again. That's the latest one. One of the first regulations got rid of abattoirs and all our cattle were being shipped to Europe because we weren't allowed to slaughter our own capital, uh, cattle. Of course, none of this ever applied in Europe. Well, uh, no, we have got some abattoirs here, I'm sure Oh, we oh yeah, we had to build brand new ones under EU regulation. Oh, yeah, and then now we're allowed to slaughter our own cattle again, but now we have big, expensive abattoirs. And you can't, like, a farmer can't kill one yeah, sheep. Yeah, it's, it's legal. You're not allowed to. I think a lot of it's going on, though, you know. <laughs> I've been offered the odd lamb myself. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hopefully, yeah. Okay, so uh, all this red tape, more and more and more red tape. Yeah, <clears throat> and, and it's generally quangos that, that enforce EU regulations. We're spending 167 billion on quangos. Um, <clears throat> we're losing 40 billion a year through industries like, like the Rover Car Company uh, that have closed down. All these little um, village petrol stations were forced to close down under EU regulations. Hundreds of businesses have gone. And yeah. do you know, one of the things that really annoys me is no business has stood up and said, the EU is closing my business. You would think small business would be up in arms. Well, they, they blame the government, don't they? They blame the government. <clears throat> um, Mark from York says, is immigration a Frankfurt School technique? Oh, gosh, absolutely. Overwhelming immigration, overwhelming our infrastructure. The government said there'd be 13 million 13,000 come in when the EU got control of our borders. Because in anybody who's in the EU is now allowed to come to England without any kind of let or hindrance. A bit more than that. The EU has controlled our borders since the 1997 Amsterdam Treaty, and the government said 13,000 would come in. We've had about 10 million in total. They, all, they never gave us the figures, but they did let it slip in 2008 that 2.7 million had come in in one year. And that was mostly from Poland, wasn't it? Well, uh, they did give us the total... F yes, that was right, yeah. Yeah. And um, not only can our infrastructure not handle it, you know, all these cities now full of immigrants, you can't drive to school, you can't drive to work, the infrastructure, the roads can't handle it. We've got 380,000 English people a year emigrating to get away from the overcrowding and the idea is to create overcrowding and tension. It's a Frankfurt School subversion technique. So they are particularly delighted to pull Muslims into the country and then try to teach us to dislike them. That is government policy. And you know, they're trying to create tension and they're doing a damn good job. But the English people are really terribly nice and very laid back and their plans to create tension have not gone anything like as well as they hoped they would. Why is that, do you think? Because we're just nice guys. I mean, we've ex we're tolerant. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. According to the Frankfurt School, we're unreasonably tolerant. Yes, we're unreasonably tolerant. We, we should be fighting on the streets now, which is their plan. I mean, you know, it, it is true, isn't it, that, you know, our schools, they're teaching multiple religions, mm. and, yes. and you, you see programmes about schools where the children speak... 30 or 40 or yeah, even more right. languages, which yes. is yes. extraordinary. Yeah. The, the, the technique destroys identity. If you flood a nation with immigrants, you destroy their identity. And that is happening, and it's, it's a stunningly successful technique. So they're destroying the family, they're destroying our industry, they're destroying our schools, infrastructure. Tax, yeah. Schools, the tax on the teachers, you know, the teachers are not allowed to do anything now. Uh, that's deliberate, that's another thing for schools. Well, do you think technique. that we should have? corporal punishment in schools? I don't want to get into that debate, but a teacher should be able to control their class and instill discipline on them. But it's hard to know what they could do, you know, they you know, well, write out lines uh, uh, or something. Yeah, but until they got to the point where, um, you know, a teacher can be sued by any student, there really wasn't a problem. But it's a frank for school subversion technique to undermine schools and teachers. Undermine authority. Yes. And also, I know that head teachers have enormous amounts of paperwork to do, so they can't spend any yes. time teaching. That's right. Or managing the teaching. Yes. 
And, yeah. and, and I, I also remember reading recently That's that correct. a lot yeah. of teachers don't want to become head teachers because it's... All paperwork, yeah. It's not the same job anymore. Yes, and it's generally quangos that are implementing that. Quangos are loading teachers down with so much paperwork they can't be teachers. It's deliberate. And it's generally common purpose David, inside quangos. We're going to go for another break now. Once again, if you'd like to text in your questions or comments to David Noakes, please do so now. Text 8778 with the word EDGE and then your text. See you very soon. Welcome back to On the Edge with me, Theo Chalmers, and my special guest, David Noakes. Right, David, I'm having loads and loads of texts, um, and they're scrolling off before I can read them. Some of them are coming in so fast, basically saying, what can we do? OK. There are things we can do, and um, this is an incredibly exciting time because you can actually save your own future if you act. You know, we've really got something to do, and it's the most exciting and worthwhile thing to do that we could possibly have, saving our own freedom. Is it, is it like, do you think it's, it's kind of like at the start of the Second World War when people thought, you know, there's a real nasty enemy, we've really mm. all got to band together and fight them on the beaches and so on? Is it a bit like that? Is it, should we have that kind of spirit? We should have that spirit, but we can't get that message out because... Freemasons and Common Purpose, the government controls all our media. It's not this program, apparently. Apparently not. <laughs> <laughs> but there aren't many like, well, there are none really like this, That's are right. there? That's right, yeah. Um, but what can we do? Well, we need a permanent general strike. Now, isn't it amazing that there are probably 20 things we can do that would work? And you need at least 10,000 people to do it. And there are five political parties that have got more than 10,000 members, and none of them are using those 10,000 members to do anything at all, apart from get themselves the leaders re-elected onto the gravy trains. None of them are fighting against the EU. And that is the proof that those leaderships are working for the EU. So UKIP does not do any of these campaigns. The BNP? Does not do any of these campaigns. It's how you know the leadership is working for the EU. So they, they make grandiose speeches, which, which make the leaders look very good, but the grassroots are never mobilised. And in UKIP in particular, if you try to start a serious anti-EU campaign, the Freemasonry regional, organize, regional organisers close you down like that. And, uh, you know, I was ruthlessly closed down on more than one occasion, and eventually they were rigging my elections, and I wrote to the leadership complaining of free, Freemasonry regional organisers. This is in Cornwall, wasn't yes, it? Yes, that's right, yeah. Anyway, what, what can we do? We need a permanent general strike. The quickest way to get out is a national general strike until our corrupt and criminal politicians either resign or strike out the six EU treaties as illegal under the British Constitution, which they are. They don't need to be repealed, they're illegal. But while we have a corrupt um, legal system, corrupt law lords, corrupt courts... Um, How likely is it, then, that that would happen? If, 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 you're saying, if you're saying that all the people who are in any kind of influential role in this yeah. country yeah. are already yeah. corrupted and unlikely to be helpful to this cause. Yes. But if we get a general strike, I used to run a newspaper. Well, I started five newspapers. I got up to 100,000 circulation. It costs about 15,000 a month to get 100,000 newspapers out there. Now, you would have thought that some wealthy business that realized it was going to be closed under EU regulation or was already losing a fortune under EU regulation would be happy to pay that 15,000 to get those profits back, to, to get the, to dump the EU costs, but no one did. Well, actually, I've got to interrupt you. Here's a, here's a really good point here about newspapers. Chaz in Newark says, how come the newspapers are all anti-EU? They are vaguely anti-EU, but they don't say what I've been saying tonight. How many newspapers admit the nation's been abolished? Why doesn't the Daily Mail start Well, I think the Express had a headline saying just that, didn't it? Right. OK, well then, why don't they start a campaign to get a general strike going? 
a strike against the EU and a strike against our corrupt politicians at Westminster until they either resign or repeal the treaties. Uh, is it not the case that, you know, the laws about striking are such that to, to solicit a general strike would pro possibly be illegal? I think that's only a case if it's a trade union. We are, we are not a trade union, we're just the people of England. So I think it, it would be perfectly okay. Okay. Another thing we could do is we need a million strong permanent demonstration in, in Westminster and that's the reason that un under the Serious Organised Crime and Police Act 2000, um, 2005 they've made it illegal to demonstrate within one kilometre of Westminster. Well, you have to have a licence to demonstrate, exactly. so you can apply for that. Yeah. And also, t uh, two million people demonstrated against the war in Iraq, and we still had a war in Iraq. Yeah, but it effectively needs to be a blockade of London until they resign. But in, in, um, in 1990 we had the poll tax mm. protests, and yep. that had an effect, didn't mm. it? Yes. So-called poll tax riots. Yeah, but see, that wasn't really affecting core EU policy, so they could... Um, they didn't really change anything, they just changed the name of it. Well, they, 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 they <laughs> abolished the poll tax and put it back uh, to uh, council tax rates. Yeah, you know, they, the, they the renamed rates. it council tax, basically. Yeah. Well, <laughs> no, 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 that's not true, because poll tax was a tax on the individual. It still is a tax on and the now, individual. And, and it went back to being a tax on the property. No, it used to be a tax on property, but council, council tax is now a tax on the individual, very definitely. Council tax is poll tax. They just renamed it. Well, I'm yes. not sure I agree with no, you. No, no, no. If you own no property and you just rent a room, you get taxed council tax. It's got nothing to do with property. You get taxed as an individual. That's a fact. Okay. A third thing is national civil disobedience would do it. If we refuse to pay taxes to our corrupt government, which, is, which has no legal right to be there anyway, um, refuse to cooperate with them any, in any way, and this would have to be on a large scale, It'd be at least 10 million people. It's involved. going to be very hard, isn't it, because one or two people say, well, I'm not going to pay my tax, then obviously yeah. they're going to go to straight, to, straight you, to jail, do not pass go. It's going to be, you that, know, it's very yeah, hard to have that mass movement all of a sudden. That's why we need the newspapers again. We, need, the, we need newspapers, 100,000 circulation minimum. Um, and, of course, the really easy way to do it is to persuade our military to arrest our criminal politicians and put them on trial for treason. Just a, a march up to Westminster, slap the whole lot in the cells, put them up before judges, and, of course, you would have to have every judge screened to make sure he's not a Freemason or you wouldn't get a fair outcome. But you're, you said earlier that every judge is a Freemason. The, no, no. Uh, Pretty well all judges are Freemasons. You can find handfuls. You can find honest judges. There are a small number of honest judges. Mm. If not, we'll have to appoint some. Sorry? If not, we'll have to appoint some. So those are the four national campaigns. Well, this sounds like the October Revolution, doesn't it? I mean, this is 1917. You're actually <laughs> suggesting that, you know, we storm the Bastille. I know I'm mixing my revolutions here. Or, or, you know... Um... Yeah, the difference between us and the Bastille is all we want is to uphold our existing constitution, which our corrupt and criminal parliament, Westminster, is destroying. Westminster is a puppet of the European Union. It is not our parliament. But surely you would also be suggesting that we get rid of our royal family, from what you've said. Yeah, we need a decent English royal family. You're right. We do. Does it, what about a Welsh royal family? <laughs> okay. You know, the ancient... Yeah, yeah, yeah. British. British royal family. We need a British royal family, not a German one. Okay, Britons. Yeah, we need Britons. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, well, hmm. Okay, well, obviously, this is not necessarily the policy of this programme <laughs> that you should revolt. I think most of our audience... Ah, we're not actually well, I'm not revolting, you know. <laughs> Sorry? All, all we're trying to do is uphold the British constitution. We're not actually revolting. So this is a peaceful process, is it? Well, it would be great if it was. So anyway, those are the four uh, national campaigns. General strike, permanent huge demonstration, national civil di disobedience, or the military to arrest our criminal politicians. Those are the four national campaigns. And these are all on your website? Yes. I, which is eutruth.org.uk. Yeah. And then... And then um, we can run local campaigns as, as individual people. So the most powerful and simple, and UKIP and the BNP could have done this so easily, is 
we need to change the minds of 70 MPs to get Lisbon repealed, right? So if we just go and visit these MPs, point out that Westminster is bound to be abolished by the EU, they will lose their comfortable 240,000 a year salary and expenses. And, of course, every dictatorship always uh, eliminates those that put it in power, because if they put it in power, they can take it out of power. So MPs are going to be under a huge threat once Westminster goes. But it's too late. <laughs> yeah, when, but when the EU <laughs> says, if what you're saying is correct, and let's yeah. uh, suppose for a moment that is the case, if uh, the EU eventually says, well, actually, we don't need a parliament anymore, so chara, you know, go home. Yep. Um, the MPs are not going to be able to say, oh, hold on. Are they? It's too late. No, no, no. If, if Westminster is still standing and MPs still exist, they but could... Well, they, they will all always be on quangos. By yeah, yeah. Well, if they're on 300,000 a year in quangos, OK, they may do nothing. But if they can't be bought off, you will notice that Jackie Smith set up FTAC in 2005. Fixated Threat Assessment. Yes, centre. Something centre, yes. Yes. And what that is, is... The government can arrest anyone they want to um, with psychiatric stroke mental reasons as the excuse and subject them to electric shock treatment in the uh, attempts to cure them, water treatment, effectively torture. And they tried this out on 168 people. One man from Plymouth wrote a letter to Jackie Smith uh, objecting to her setting up a police state. He was seized by FTAC. What a perfect body, Soviet style to control any Westminster dissident. politicians. Mm. Dissident Westminster politicians. Ideal. It's how they did it in the Soviet Union. Blow me down, they set up the same thing here. This is the future that any dissident Westminster MP is looking at. He's looking at being institutionalized, held against his will, and losing his 240,000 a year. Why shouldn't he swap sides? I have to say, that has some attraction, doesn't it? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, you know, if we had... Uh, 10,000 people, we've got 646 MPs, that's m more than 10 people to an MP. Every week someone should be sat in front of their MP saying, do you want to lose your 240,000 a year? Do you want to have electric shock treatment in a, in, in a hospital behind bars for the rest of your life because you're a dissident? Maybe not. Maybe you should vote against the EU dictatorship. Well, they can't vote. There is no vote, is there? No. A private member's bill can be brought in by any one of them. Yes, and then, and then the government says, no thanks, doesn't it? No, That's no, what no. always happens. No, no, if they get enough of them, they can vote it through. They can get it out. They can throw Lisbon out. They still can. So that's, that's another campaign. It's, okay. it's a very effective campaign. Well, so, someone is saying here, uh, arrange a strike date on your website, and when we get enough people prepared to do it, we'll go ahead. And they say, remember, rage against the machine, the Christmas number one, which was the response to yep. some appalling television yep. program that always got its song mm. at number one. Yep. Um, we need to hit more people. We need to hit, you know, we need to hit 100,000 people in a month. We're only hitting 6,000 in a month at the moment. We need 100,000 people as an absolute minimum well, to do okay. something on that Someone scale. here is saying, hey, Theo, how do we get the population of the UK to combine with the nutters, as we are called, who speak the truth? You know, that is, that is the barrier, isn't it? You've come up, you've sat on this programme tonight, and you've said a lot of things which many people will probably think are... Too insane, too crazy mm. to yes. be true. Mm. Now, I don't know whether they're true or not. We, we, give you, we give you a platform to say those things, but a lot of people who watch it will be, you know, perhaps intrigued, perhaps a little bit believing, perhaps a little bit disbelieving. But it, to do what you're suggesting that people need to mm. do to mm. overthrow mm. this EU yes. dictatorship, yeah. if you like, mm. you need to have a huge number of people believing what you're Correct. saying. How do you achieve that critical mass? That's why I started the newspapers. But you don't do it anymore. You have the website. Well, I, I need 15,000 a month to do the newspapers. That was the trouble. And I, it was all right when I was producing 5,000, but, 
by the time the circulation got up to 10, 100,000, I couldn't finance it anymore. Well, why didn't you sell them? Why didn't you become the Daily Express or... <laughs> You know, I mean, but the newspapers are a bit old century, aren't they, with all due respect to the national media, but, you know, everyone's on the internet now, aren't they? So how, you know, you've got a great website, or a well put together website with lots of facts and data on it, but um, how do you get people to go to your website? Well, I was hitting, you know, 100,000 newspapers read by five people each, that's half a million a month, 6,000 a month comes to the website. I've never been a great believer in the internet as a marketing tool. It works sometimes brilliantly, it doesn't in other cases, and it's not working in this case, in, in a big enough, on a big enough scale, or newspapers were. Okay, so, all right, what else? You've, you've mentioned a few things that people can do. Well, um, uh, another thing that, that is really valuable is to contact your local newspaper arrange a meeting with journalists, take them out to lunch or go around to their office, meet them in a pub and explain this to them. Well, that's not going to happen, you know, is it? People, journalists, random people ringing journalists and saying, let's go for a drink. <laughs> Trust me, that's not going to happen. You can talk to them on the phone. Yeah, OK. And say, yep. I want to talk to you about <laughs> this. Are you aware of what's really <laughs> happening? Have you been to, <laughs> for instance, <laughs> eutruth.org.uk? do you know what's really happening kind of conversation but it, but even then, just supposing you got the journalist to buy into that story mm. they're gonna and it, just supposing they write the story and they give it to their editor yes you've already said that the correct. media is controlled absolutely correct so the editor is going to spike it isn't he or she yes, exactly and what's going to happen then you're going to create tension inside the newspaper and the journalist is going to realize that you're speaking the truth well, no, because the editor won't say, I've been told by my controllers in common purpose, the Freemasons... No, but when his story gets spiked for no apparent reason, and he's just spent a few hours researching it and writing it, but he's going to be stories missed. are spiked all the time because there's no space or because an advertiser has bought that space or whatever. Yeah. You know. But just think, if you were UKIP and you had 30,000 members... The reason the membership kept dropping off is because they were never given anything to do. They were never given a campaign to fight, and they realised the leadership wasn't doing anything. But if you've got 10, 30,000 members, and they're contacting journalists continually, eventually, after about the 10th telephone call, the journalist is going to start being interested. What the hell's going on here? That might have an impact. I, I, I think that possibly mm. would. Yeah. But then, but like I say, you've got to get to those people first before the media has a chance to get to them, if you like. Yeah. So, and that's the question. That's a simple question I'm asking. Is there a method by which you can get this message to enough people, convince enough people, get enough people committed to this mm. change? Because, I mean, it's like, basically, it's... People have to be under very heavy duress before they suddenly decide, OK, enough is enough. Yeah. And And this... What's happened to the UK uh, has been very gradual, hasn't it, over exactly. a long period of yes. time. So people haven't really noticed... It's been very subtle. ...what's happened. Exactly. And, and they can put it down to other mm. things, can't yes. they? They can say it's caused by different things, you know, too many people coming in the yeah. country or yeah. just yeah. a general, you know, the depression yeah. with the banks and all yeah. these... They can blame lots of different things. There's no... There's nowhere to point the finger, really. No. That's deliberate. It's brilliant. It's, it's Frankfurt School at its best. It yeah. is superb. It is a superb piece of national sabotage. And it's, it, it is national. OK. Yeah. So, actually, I've got to ask you, there was a text a long time ago, so I mm. can't credit whoever it was who wrote it, who said, in Europe, then, in mm. this plan, yes. mm. who is number one? The most senior Bilderberger that we're un obviously aware of is Angela Merkel. She seems to give Gordon Brown his orders. Um, who's the top of the pile? Right at the very top, it's probably a Rothschild or, a, or maybe a Rockefeller, but almost certainly a, Ro a Rothschild, um, and quite a few steps in between. And it's all a bit surprising to me that the, the royal family is involved, and they are so senior, but they are very senior in it. And the Queen has been a supporter of the EU throughout her adult life. But she doesn't turn up at Bilderberger meetings, does she? 
No, that would be a bit... Um, I think Prince Philip has, though. Well, one of the Dutch royal family has. Yes, and of course the whole thing was started off by a relative of theirs, Prince Bernhard of the Netherlands. And the a, first a, meeting was in the Netherlands, wasn't it, I believe? Yeah, at the Bilderberg Hotel, and yeah. because he was a former Nazi SS officer. <laughs> well, it all goes around in a big circle, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Brenda in Hull says, Theo, stop knocking him. <laughs> I don't think I'm knocking you, I'm just trying to extract the facts. No, I would agree with you. Thank you. Yeah. So, um, so you've suggested certain things that people can do, you know, go to their MP, write to the papers. Yes. Yeah, I mean, the simplest campaign of all, just shock two people a day with the truth. You know, print out stuff off your website and just give it to people. Yes, but, but tell them, do you know the EU is a dictatorship? And when they say don't talk rubbish, just say read that. Because, I mean, people think, well, we vote for a, a, member, of a member of the European mm. Parliament, an MEP, yeah. and they assume, I suppose, that those MEPs are the equivalents of members of Parliament mm. in our Parliament, in the British mm. Parliament. Yeah, I mean, pretty well any MEP will tell you the whole thing's a farce and they have no power at all. Our MPs have much more power than they do in... In Brussels. But is that because of scale or because of the, the way it's constituted? That's the way it's constituted. Basically, the EU is very strictly designed on the Soviet model. You have the politburos, which have the power. You have the executive, which is the commission. That's it, really, nothing else. So counts. who's in the politburo then? Who's at the top? Who are those people? Well, it's, it's all Bilderbergers. It's 27 Bilderbergers. It's the prime ministers? Yes, all of whom are Bilderbergers and all of whom are bought paid for, owned by the EU, and totally for it. They don't represent us at all. None of them do. Not one? Not one. Not. So you can't possibly sneak in there <laughs> as a non-Bilderberger? No, you can't. No. You can't get in. No. And it's not, <laughs> it's not open to people <laughs> to apply, is it? No, not really. <laughs> to become no. a Bilderberger. You have to get no. like a... No. Hand-delivered note, do you? Yeah. So, I mean, if you are seriously anti-EU, like me, you are excluded from politics. I mean, I, I'm not expecting a political career because you know, I know I will never be allowed in. So you can play the game. You can be like uh, Nick Farage or... Uh, sorry, what's his name? Nigel Farage. Nigel Farage yeah. or... I was thinking of the other one, Nick, the BNP. Nick Griffin. Nick yeah. Griffin. You can yeah. be playing that game or, uh, yeah. you know, overtly mm. being anti-EU. Yes. You see, that's what Nigel Farage does. He makes great speeches in, uh, in the EU Parliament. You think, wow, he's really going for it. Mm. Meanwhile, the f he's doing it in the certain knowledge that his speeches will go absolutely nowhere because the Freemasons in his party, the regional organisers, are making absolutely certain that nothing develops. So he can look glorious knowing nothing will happen. OK. Somebody called The Chin is saying, Christmas number one got over 200,000 votes. Have some faith and set up a strike date that we can all sign up to. So they're asking you to do that, David. Yes. I would definitely go for that, but I don't want it to be a damn squid, and I want to make sure that we can reach enough people. Well, that's um, the problem, isn't yeah, it? And of course, moment, and it's like those two people who who were rebelling against Gordon Brown, yep. ex-cabinet members who thought they had a backing. They had, like, come on, yeah. guys, let's all do it. And then it yeah. was like, ooh. And yeah. it was a damp squib, wasn't yeah. it? There have been too many damp squibs. The trouble is just about every organisation is penetrated. So people think, oh, yes, we're going to do this. And someone at the top of the organisation kills it off. And I don't want to have a damp squib. I want to make sure it works. And to do that, we need to be able to reach a lot of people, and we can't do that at the moment. Well, does it need somebody like, you know, somebody's mentioning John Lennon here. Could, does it need somebody like a John Lennon or somebody to say, yes, follow me? Well, yeah, I mean, The Who, very patriotic rock group. Now, they could rewrite Won't Be Fooled Again with the words, the, the lyrics that I've put on the website and go and blast it around. That would be enough. The Who could do it. Well, I'm not so sure, really. Pete Townsend had a few uh, allegations of something against him, didn't he, not so long ago? which I don't think I'm going to go into on this show. <laughs> Who cares? They can get the publicity. OK. Well, on that note, then, uh, we are going to go for the break. But, uh, David, thank you very much indeed. And that is all we've got time for. Thank you to everyone for watching our special two-hour show. And for those who texted, and thanks to my very special guest, David Noakes.
If you want more information, the website to go to is eutruth.org.uk. Next week, we'll be back with yet another exciting show that might even change your life, or your politics, perhaps. Until then, remember, they're watching you, watching us, watching them. Cheerio.